the connection. My father was a high school teacher who studied, taught, researched, lived, and breathed American history. Yes, you could say that my dad took history and all events that were shaping history very seriously indeed. So when the first manned space flight started to happen with the Mercury Space Program in 1962, there was my father with his eyes glued to the black and white television set with his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder recording every detail. Our whole family listened to Walter Cronkite pontificate about all the specifications of the Atlas rocket and the potential problems that could also occur before, during, and after liftoff. And especially during the flight into the outer space, he graphically detailed the dangers in the astronauts attempting to survive the enormous heat of re-entry at velocities human beings had never traveled before as the Mercury capsule fell over 100 miles from the sky, then parachuted to land upon the ocean, hopefully near enough to a Navy ship to be rescued before that tiny space vessel would sink. When the Atlas rocket crowned with the spaceship was towed to the launching pad at Cape Canaveral, it just always seemed like mission control was finding another problem that delayed the launch. It was T minus this, and then T minus that, and then Houston, we have a problem. And never the expected 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, liftoff. The rocket ship rarely ever seemed to launch at the scheduled time. But there was my father and mother and us three brothers all huddled together around our clunky black and white TV set for hours not to miss the few seconds of blast off. Now the whole time my father recorded and chronicled every detail of these amazing events while holding out in front of him his trusty microphone with a three foot microphone cord attached to his reel to reel tape recorder. Now the price of admission to our small living room was that we all had to be quiet. We could not talk. We couldn't make any noise of any type. And we had to remain absolutely silent as we did not want to destroy the chronicle of antiquity. It was like a scene from some Second World War submarine movie where all the nervous crew were ordered to rig for silent running to prevent the destroyers above them from dropping depth charges upon them, our poor family. My dad was delighted that I took such an interest in the rocket ships and space travel, but unfortunately, I alone in the family supported him in his obsession to record the space saga. After seeing John Glenn orbit the Earth, I said to everyone, we are now living in the future. At eight years of age, I was so full of curiosity and we had so many emerging questions as Walter Cronkite prattled on and on about the drama unfolding upon our television set. I wanted to ask my father, who of course seemed to know everything to me, to answer these questions as they were burning in my heart and they came to my mind. But unfortunately, I did not possess the maturity to wait for hours after the launch was over and the recording the holy recording was completed to launch my queries. So I found this silent treatment absolutely grueling. My younger and older brothers did not seem to share my scientific curiosity, but instead got into trouble repeatedly because they did not take things as seriously as they needed to. They were just kids, 11 and five, and they wanted to play, which even in the adjoining rooms of our tiny wartime bungalow, created interference on the sacred recording and a distraction to my serious-minded father. I remember feeling so very sorry for my sweet mom, the peacemaker, who was always trying to please everyone with the impossible task of attempting to keep her three high-energy sons quiet enough to accommodate her beloved husband's passion. I wish that we could somehow just 
look at the television and record the program's audio track without being limited in our ability to talk or make the nor normal noises of a family. My dad was sitting right beside me on our couch, but he was so focused tending his microphone and tape recorder, he was like he was a million miles away. I felt that I just could not say one word. I couldn't cough, sneeze, rustle, move, or even breathe sometimes without him throwing me one of those withering looks that only a father can make. No one was allowed to ever touch my father's tape recorders. Anything that, was, that belonged to him, he guarded with his life. And he, we weren't allowed to touch the thousand of books that literally decorated the walls of our modest house. But when he was in the bathroom, I closely looked at his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And I noticed a small hole beside the hole that the microphone was plugged into. And that hole had the words, Uggs, in. During a station break, I asked my dad about the function for Uggs, in. And he did not know. And while he was teaching the next day, I asked my mother for the phone number of my uncle, who was, he taught electrical engineering at the Algonquin Community College. I told him about our dilemma, and I told him about Augs Inn. He explained that Augs Inn is a female RCA receptacle for an external microphone with a longer cord with a male RCA jack. So you get closer to the speaker with less interference. And then he stated, too bad there wasn't an external female RCA receptacle, a nogs in, auxiliary in, marked on the outside of the TV. Because then you could just plug a long wire with two male RCA jacks, one end into the tape recorder and the other end into the TV. My uncle then said that the sound would go directly from the TV speaker right into the recorder. And we could yell and scream and play and beat drums and carry on normal lives with absolutely no distracting sound to ever disrupt the tape recorders of the annals of history. Sad sadly, there was no external female RCA plug in our TV. But that got me thinking. I figure if somehow I could get a long enough cord with an RCA male jack to plug into the tape recorder, and somehow connect the two wires of the other end of the recorder to the speaker inside our television, perhaps a miracle might happen and the recording problem would be solved forever. I had been given a wood-burning iron set to do crafts for my birthday. And my uncle said that, yeah, that would probably enable me to solder the two ends of the wire into the transmission speaker. I proposed this plan to my mother, who had been suffering in silence, overwhelmed, trying to keep three rowdy boys quiet for hours on end. And I explained the proposal and methodology in great detail, quoting my uncle liberally. Eventually, I talked her into going with me to the local hardware store to buy a long male RCA jack cable and a small roll of solder. My dear mom, was so anxious, but I carefully followed the instructions my uncle had given me as to not be electrocuted or receive a massive shock from the TV's built-in capacitor. I unplugged the television and waited for 30 full minutes to allow the capacitor to drain as my uncle ordered me to do before I even opened up the back of our family television set. I was glad that the speaker was easily accessible. It was now only 15 minutes until my father returned from teaching, and I had to hurry. I stripped the insulation off the ends of the two wires of that gray RCA cord, and then round each wire around the speaker terminals, and then I touched my hot iron to the tip of the solder roll. A pungent aroma filled the air, and the solder suddenly sizzled as a quarter-inch dot of solder melted onto in and around the wires patch and instantly hardened. It took less than a minute to attach this cord to the speaker wires. I, 
rolled an RCA cord and I laced it through the hole in the back of the casing of the TV and then laid the 12 foot long cord along the floor, leaving the male RCA jack and right by my, tele my dad's tape recorder. You see, I didn't dare touch his device without his permission. And then I plugged in the TV and turned it on. Thankfully, it still worked. And I waited for my father to come through the door. I heard the car door slam. And then I saw my dad, briefcase in hand, in his uniform of suit and tie, breach the door, kiss my mother, and then turn to face me. I was so excited to show him what I had done. But strangely, he seemed initially perturbed that at only eight years of age, I had taken such a risk of opening and doing electrical work on a television set. He was upset, and not only at me, but at my mom, despite our assurances that we strictly followed our technologically gifted uncle's safety directions. And I had to repeatedly explain exactly what I had done. Grumbling, my dad decided to detach his previous microphone and insert my new cord into the augs in of this recorder. Then he pressed the record and play buttons together and attempted to tape the nightly news. When he rewound it, he pressed play. And there was a crisp, clear recording of the news with no hisses, snaps, pops, or any other noise. Next, my father recorded music from the Lawrence Welk Orchestra and asked all of us to bang chairs, yell, laugh. Upon playback, all we could hear was the pure, unblemished beauty of the music. Like a child with a new toy, he kept making recordings and demanded that we all would jump up and down and even scream to see if any of this cacophony was captured. But the recordings were all flawless. Now my dad could perfectly record history without the impediments of his family. From that time on, every person that came to our door had to witness this marvelous invention of the ages that should surely win a Nobel Science Award, according to my father. He told everyone about his eight-year-old son who had just developed a cure for cancer, built the pyramids, and discovered a fire. I told him that it was really nothing, as it, was only, it only took a few minutes from the beginning to the end, and that I was just doing exactly what my uncle had taught me. But my father, no, he continued bragging about me and made me feel like I was some type of up-and-coming technological genius. I did not take myself so seriously, but thought that this unsophisticated direct wiring was an obvious and easy fix to both help my dad and solve the family's problem being created by my father's obsession. We used that cord for years, and when that TV broke, I took out that cord and reinstalled it onto our next television set so my father could continue to enjoy making these interference-free recordings without the disruptions of his family. Sometimes the simple is the most profound. In later life, after I became a Christian, I realized that so much of our life we're trying to listen to the Lord and understand what he's saying. What is he saying to us? What's he asking us to do? But often just the normality of a family and life, there can be so many distractions that just get in the way. Like my father's initial attempts to tape the rocket launch with the microphone, God's message often becomes distorted because life just happens. Similar to my dad's tape recording, we need a type of spiritual RCA cord to patch us directly, heart to heart, into our Savior. As my uncle told me how to make that patch cord, Jesus tells us in detail in John 16, 13, that he is sending us the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our counselor, who will be right inside us to make a direct connection with God himself. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, 
He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but the Holy Spirit will tell you what he's heard. He will tell you about the future. You see, just like that RCA chord prevents distortion, God says in Ezekiel 36, 27, that he will put his spirit in you so that you'll be able to follow his decrees and be careful to obey his regulations. Just as that solder melted and bonded the wires to the speaker, do you know that the Holy Spirit welds himself into our spirit, making us alive to God so we, are tru so we truly belong to him? I am so glad that the Lord promised that because we're his children, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into our hearts, and it prompts us to cry out, cry out Abba, Father, as the Bible declares in Galatians 4, 6. You see, Jesus has given us our own RCA cord. As we've received Christ's anointing, this Holy Spirit connection gives us the power to obey God, follow his word, as it states in 2 Timothy 1.14, that through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, he carefully guards the precious truth that's been entrusted to us. I finished writing this story on the very day of Pentecost, May 28, 2023, when 1990 years ago, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church to empower them to be witnesses of the good news that Jesus died to save us and rose again to give us this new life-giving connection to God. You have a Holy Spirit RCA cord within you. Just allow God to speak into you and you will hear him clearly. God bless you.